In 79 AD, this volcano exploded. Down below, around the Bay of Naples, there were farms, houses, luxurious villas, Roman towns. The best known is Pompeii. The eruption which wiped this ancient town off the Roman map is one of the world's most famous disasters. But the tragedy has given historians a priceless legacy. The inhabitants were overwhelmed by gas, lethal gas, volcanic debris, and we found their bodies exactly where they died. Many have been cast in plaster, frozen in time. They've tantalized the world with their last horrific moments of death. But they tell us little about their lives. Now, in a cellar just two miles outside Pompeii, are 54 well-preserved skeletons lying exactly where they died. They were hiding from the full force of the volcano. 2,000 years later, they're about to give up their secrets. I'm wondering whether they can tell us something about the most interesting question in Pompeii, which is not how the people died. We know how they died. It's about how the people in Pompeii actually lived. For the 25 years I've taught classics at Cambridge, I've been fascinated by what life was really like day to day in ancient Pompeii. I'm hoping these skeletons will help take this understanding one step further and put my theories to the test. I'll explore the opulent and the ordinary. <laughs> Don't have to be rich to wear jewellery. In a city of the refined and the rude. It looks to me as if the woman is on top of him, but sucking his toes. I'll see the hardship endured and the pleasures savoured. These guys don't look too pissed yet. I can't find where I left my glass. I want to see if we can probe a bit deeper and get beneath the skin of this ancient town. You don't get closer to real Rome mm. than being in a cesspit, do you? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that the people in the cellar will help me discover what life was like before Vesuvius forced them to flee. Pompeii is the most important archaeological site in the Roman world. Nowhere else do we come face to face with antiquity up close in quite this personal way. These perfectly preserved ruins bring millions of us here each year to see a snapshot of Roman life. But that's all we see, a snapshot of a society where it appears the rich enjoyed a life of luxury and everyone else poor and the slaves lived lives of drudgery. That's always seemed too simple to me. It's much more interesting than that. I want to bust a few myths about the rich and the poor in Pompeii. This was the stretch of coastline where rich Romans, and I mean really, really rich Romans from the capital, used to come for their holidays. It was supposed to be particularly popular with the fast set. They came here to gamble, to have fun, to have sex. Sort of a cross between Las Vegas and Brighton. And that's what makes Pompeii so remarkable. It was a town where ordinary people lived cheek by jowl with the hedonistic rich. It had all the essentials of a Roman town with a forum at one end and at the other an amphitheatre and training ground for gladiators. A market, temples, baths, even a brothel. Perhaps 12,000 people packed into less than a square mile. Pompeii lies between the Mediterranean and Vesuvius. It's 17 miles along the coast from Naples, not far from Herculaneum. And it's in a suburb of Pompeii, a plontis, where the cellar of skeletons was unearthed.
It must have seemed a sensible place to come. It's partly underground, and that would have seemed safe, but it's got good access from the road outside. It's very hard not to be moved by this site. I mean, they may be 2,000 years old, but they're still victims of a terrible human tragedy. On the other hand, I can't help wondering what these bones might tell us about the life of these people. The first thing we can tell from the cellar is that these people appear to be divided into two groups. On one side, they were carrying money and jewels. These bodies had been catalogued and tidied away into boxes. The others, left where they fell, were found with nothing. So how can we explain this divide? You could come up with all kinds of theories as to why it might be. But for my money, the most likely thing is that we're dealing with a distinction in wealth. These skeletons are important because many of the bones found at Pompeii have simply been jumbled up. And the plaster casts, they're very poignant, but they're much less useful for forensic science because the bones inside get contaminated. Remains preserved, like those in the cellar, exactly where the people died, are rare. For the first time, these are going to be analysed by a forensic team led by Fabian Kanz. So far, we have found at least 54 individuals here, at least. And this gives us a broad cross-section of the society of, of uh, the Roman at that time. The point is we have a great opportunity here because we have a snapshot of the society. We might have slaves, we might have upper-class people, and we can find out if there were, have been big differences. One of the most complete skeletons is a man aged about 55. Apart from some dental cavities, he seems in pretty good nick. If we look at the other bones, I mean, I noticed this. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know much about skeletons, but that looks to me like something that's got a real big muscle attachment. Yeah, yeah, it's the right upper arm. And it's the muscle attachment for the brachialis. And as you can see on the left side, it's nearly the same. Yeah. And he must be a really strong man. He's my age, he's got about as good teeth as me, but he's much stronger. These are the rest of his bones, but why are his bones green? <laughs> yeah, you are right. On the whole left side, he's green, and greens come from metal objects, which means he was wealthy. There was some bronze or copper or brass object buried with him. He had considerable amount of metal wealth with him. Yeah and the acid in the soil is reacting with the metal objects, right, and that makes him green. Right. Nearly all of the so-called rich sample have been at least one or two bones green. So they've all been buried close to um, something metal. Valuable. Whereas what we're calling the poor, do any of them have this green? No, one? not at all. Carrying no possessions at all, the bones of the people on one side are unmarked. But on the other side of the cellar, the people with green bones were discovered with a dazzling array of objects. These are now kept in a guarded vault at the Archaeological Museum in Naples. For the very first time, I've been allowed to get really close to this amazing stuff and actually get my hands on it. Look, this is really exciting for me. This is the first time I've ever touched any jewellery from Pompeii and I'm going to be very naughty and I'm going to put the bracelet on. And however cynical you are, however much a boring old academic you are, it's still exciting to wear the bracelet worn 2,000 years ago and uh, nothing will ever stop me thinking that's exciting. I think this is very attractive, actually. Pick it up, you can feel instantly it's heavy. This is a solid bangle. But what strikes you about it instantly is it's so big. It's not only women that wear bracelets, this could be man's jewellery. Uh, it's a big hunking man. 
this really is a very, very delicate um, piece of jewellery. They told me very specially that I'm not allowed to try this one on. Um, the, the links are really tiny. It's very high quality workmanship, very nicely done. Um, it must have been, it would be very pricey now, it must have been pricey then too. There was a vast treasure hoard in the cellar. Close to the skeleton of the man with green bones was a woman in her early 20s. She had with her one of the very, very biggest amounts of money found with anybody anywhere in Pompeii. Uh, in Roman currency, it was 10,000 sesterces. What that means is it's about the equivalent of 10 years' pay for a legionary Roman soldier. And these are some of the coins, some were in silver, uh, but a lot were in gold. And she had them with her in two separate containers. Instantly, you can see that the silver ones are very worn. And these have actually have been money in circulation. These are for actually buying things in the Pompeia marketplace. But the gold ones are in absolutely beautiful condition. Uh, so I think what that tells us is these really have been somebody's savings. So I think you can imagine very easily what must have happened, that uh, the people were fleeing, uh, they wanted to take their valuables with them, they get the purse, they stuff what's most important to them, they, this thing, these things, they stuff it inside the purse, put it in their pocket and off they go. This is what the people in the cellar chose to take with them as they tried to escape. They sought refuge from the eruption in what was probably an underground storeroom. They never made it further than this cellar in Oplontis. The building above the cellar appears at first like a two-storey residential home. But if you explore a little further, you see that much more was going on. There's a large building with two floors of storerooms, piles of big containers and wheel ruts made by hundreds of carts. This was clearly more than somebody's house. This is an agricultural depot. It's ghostly now. In Roman times, it must have been an absolute hub of activity with people packing things up, carting things, wheeling them off. Uh, getting them ready for dispatch. Whoever owned this place must have been pretty wealthy. But he wasn't anything like as wealthy as one of his neighbours, because just over there, few yards from this place, is one of the most luxurious villas ever found in all of the Roman world. The cellar is only a stone's throw from this stunning Roman mansion. A hundred rooms decorated with sumptuous frescoes, painted with pigments from the farthest corners of the Roman Empire. And to top it all, an Olympic-sized 200-foot-long swimming pool where the guests could let their hair down. So, while the rich frolicked at their pool parties, what was life like on the streets of Pompeii? Mattia Buondono's family has lived in Pompeii for generations and he's one of the site's most experienced guides. He's got a local sense of how this place might once have been. What's your sense of what the ancient town was like, the basics, what was life like here? Smell. Smell of people. Smell of the activity of commerciality that was here. Smell of on everywhere, smelling of money. And the smell of the animals too, presumably. Yes. And just think of the smell of the shit. Yes. Awful. For them was normal life. To get an idea of Pompeii as the people in the cellar would have seen it, I've come to Naples. Though it's a modern city, there are some striking similarities with the ancient town nearby. So, 
you could feel yourself in Pompeii. Here? Yes. Now why? In, in you feel yourself in Pompeii because, here? Because, because more or less the atmosphere, the first floor, and the busy town. It's easy to forget that Pompeii was a two-storey town. People lived above their shops and bars, and stairs opened right onto the streets, just as they do in Naples today. I think people often wonder where all the stuff was in a Pompeian shop or a bar. I think what this, this tells you is that it, uh, you could hang a lot of it up. You could actually hang it from the ceiling. Like they did 2,000 years ago, as this painting shows us. All around modern Naples are echoes of Pompeii's past, from the doors, just like the ones you see in Pompeian frescoes. There are things like this in Pompeii. Oh, yes, 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 they yes. had, they had. Yes. Careful, because we don't want the owners no, to Okay, come. we can get that. To the images they left on their walls. Well, I think the graffiti is pretty Pompeian. The Pompeian graffiti were better than this. They're better than, yes. yes. They're wittier, wittier, yes, I think. <laughs> now, that's very Pompeian, isn't it? No, Pompeii was, uh, was cleaner there. Pompeii was cleaner than that? Yeah. Do you really think so? Oh, yes, it'd be But here, yeah, you don't, do you? So, we can find all kinds of clues as to how ancient Pompeians lived in modern Naples. But what can the bones from the cellar add to the picture of their lives? See, this looks quite ordinary to me. This, this is a leg bone. This is the lower part of the leg bone. And if you compare it to this bone, it's swollen. Oh, yeah, nice. No, and uh, and no, you can see okay. all these little holes. And what is that? This is the infection of the skin and the bone. A possible reason for this might be a cut. This is one, one explanation for it. So you get a cut, you haven't got antiseptic. Did the cut, um, yeah. You, um, maybe don't even know exactly what the relationship is between dirt and infection. No. Um, and so the cut never properly heals yeah. and is a kind of lifetime infection, really. Yeah, yeah. Painful or not painful? It's very painful, very painful. So where could this infection have come from? After all, we tend to think of Romans as a rather clean lot, regularly visiting the baths. It's true that bathing was an important part of life, as we can see at the baths near the Forum in Pompeii. They give us a better picture than anywhere else in the world of how Roman bathing actually worked. This is where you took your clothes off. Uh, I think it must have been quite stunning to come in from the hot, sweaty outside through the narrow corridor into this beautifully decorated room. I think you have to imagine the baths as being a place where someone whose life could be a bit drab could come to bright colours, twinkling lights, water, splashing, everybody with their clothes off. The baths were the people's palace. Bathing was a great leveller. Almost everyone in ancient Rome, rich and poor, men and women, would have gone to the baths, including the people from our cellar. These feats of engineering had underfloor heating, a series of hot and cold rooms. And in Rome itself, they could even have a library attached. You get all sorts of things out of coming to a Roman bath. You get hot and cool and you get rest. But I think it's also crucial to remember, you get wonderful things to look at too. And the ceiling still has some traces of the kinds of uh, over-the-top decoration that you expect in a really good Roman bath. And everybody shares those things. We tend to think of these luxurious baths as pristine marble palaces where people came to get clean. But is that really the case? Here is where I guess you'd have spent your time, in this lovely marble pool. It's a bit like a jacuzzi. I think, think California, or perhaps think rugby club. You sit down, the warm water's around your feet. This is a great time to relax, to talk to your friends in this lovely setting. There is, however, a nasty surprise in store. 
We can see ever so clearly where the water comes into this pool. There's a nice little uh, spout here bringing the water in. But you can look all around and there isn't a single place where it can go out. What this means is there is absolutely no circulation of water at all in this pool. All the people who piss in here, their sweat, it all comes into a steaming, hot, watery mass. Just how healthy is that? Well, it's not at all healthy. Even some Roman doctors realised it wasn't healthy. There's a great Roman doctor called Celsus who says, make sure you don't go to the baths if you've got an open wound, because you're likely to die of gangrene if you do. Whether the people in the cellar made that connection, we don't know. But the bones offer an extraordinary revelation about another area of the population's health. So, these are two different people, are they? They are two different people, 10 to 12 year old children. They're both the same age and they have both the same abnormalities on their teeth. We think most probably they have been twins. So they made the same teeth. Really? Yeah, and yeah. they had a problem. On closer examination of the twins' teeth, Fabian's colleague Marce Henneberg discovered evidence of a horrible and unexpected disease. They must have a, a massive illness, illnesses. And one possible explanation for it is, is uh, congenital syphilis. I'm not, I'm not joking, but... Uh, I thought syphilis didn't come to Europe until much later than this. I mean, yeah, so if this were the case, yeah. this would be our first Roman case of congenital syphilis. Yes, of course. Well, that would be something to find in this cellar, wouldn't it? If this is true, it would overturn the idea that the disease first arrived in Europe with Columbus's sailors. This would be the first recorded case of syphilis by more than 1,400 years. But the twins in the cellar also tell us about another aspect of ancient Roman life. This must have been a really bad and serious illness. Somebody had to took care of them. Very, a lot of care, a lot of health care, a lot of uh, uh, effort to, that they made, made it. What strikes me is that they were found in the so-called poor sample, but still must have received years of medical care. I mean, it, it is interesting because it's going from a really nice scientific observation yeah. just to a glimpse of a family support network, yeah. parents looking after them. Yeah. The very base of their survival is about human care. Yeah. The possibility of a sexually transmitted disease might at first sight reinforce a view many people have of ancient Rome as a society of debauchery and sexual excess. There's willies, big willies, everywhere. When one object was first found in a Pompeian bar, it was deemed too shocking to be put on public display. It's a bronze lamp and all kinds of things dangled off it bells and stuff, the kind of wind chimes for us. The Romans would have called it a tintinabulum. But the centre of attention must have been this chap here, a bronze hunchback pygmy with a huge willy, which he is in the process of cutting off. Now, I like to think that this shows uh, greater anxiety on the part of the Romans about their masculinity, but who knows? Maybe it's a strange form of erotica. Maybe it's a joke on the guys who came to drink in the bar. Or is it, in the end, just a lamp? Whatever its function, you only need to stroll around town to see the same phallic theme again and again. What did they mean? What were they for? Everybody's had a theory, and there have been some pretty mad ones. Uh, do they, for example, point to the nearest brothel? Well, I'm afraid not, I hope. If this were the case, Pompeii would be littered with brothels. Some people think it is, but I'm not so sure. 
If you look carefully at this upmarket bathhouse, you see that displays of sex can be interpreted differently. The painting on the room you come into features all kinds of sexual positions, from back, from the front, with the tongue, you name it, it's here. Not just that, each one is given a number. This has launched the theory that this bath establishment is not just a bath establishment, but has, perhaps on the upper floor, a brothel attached. It's a kind of massage parlour with fringe activities. I'm afraid the truth about these paintings is a bit more mundane. And what we've really come into is the changing room. You can see along the walls the place where the shelf to hold your clothes would have been put. And what these paintings are, I think, are not adverts for the sex that might be going on upstairs. You know, please could I have three hours of number four? I think they are a clever way of helping you remember where you left your tunic or your toga. And in fact, if you look rather carefully at what the numbers are written on, they're written on kind of wicker baskets, which I think is what we imagine would be on the shelf below where you left your belongings. So the idea would be, mm, I left my toga near the fellatio. It's a kind of joke. But if you head across town, there is one building where there is no debate about its intended function. As far as I'm concerned, this is the town's one and only known brothel. Now, this is where you can see that the whole wall is covered with the graffiti of the customers. They're an interesting multicultural bunch. There's a couple in Greek. They're very hard to read. Latin handwriting is absolutely dreadful. But this one here it is clear and pretty typical. Uh, I came along here and I had a good fuck, which is about as clear as you can get. It's a pretty gloomy place. And I think my heart goes out to the prostitutes um, who have to work here, honestly. The sex here still sells 2,000 years later because this is the most popular visitor attraction on the entire site. This place is always packed with people because we still have a glamorous view about Roman sex and Roman brothels. We also get told a lot of rubbish about it. If you listen to what the tour guides are saying here, they look at these paintings up above the cubicles and they say oh what these are they're the menu at the brothel you, know, you might not be able to speak latin very well but you could always ask like in a bar for you know can i have some of that one above that door um, it's, it's rubbish it doesn't add up to me I, mean, I think they are fantasy images about sex this place is bad enough um, it's dark, it's dingy, the girls are working in prison cells, effectively. Um, you don't have to make it worse by pretending that it's... You came and chose sex like you choose a hamburger. Between the frescoes, the fallacies and the brothel, you can see how he ended up with the image of Pompeii as a society obsessed with sex. But we need to think again about this ancient myth. My idea is pretty simple, honestly. I don't really think that the Romans are any more interested in sex than we are. I think it's much more to do with male power. It's to say, this is a very masculine culture. Roman power is about male power. The phallus tells you that Roman power is built on its masculinity. We've been too keen to see sex in every corner of Pompeii. And that may go for another image of Roman life, too. We picture the rich gorging themselves in gluttonous feasts, while the poor and the slaves who serve them go hungry. I wonder if the skeletons in the cellar can give us a different view on that, too. Fabian, is there anything that you've been able to discover so far which might tell us about the diet of these people? From 
what we can see with the naked eye, we didn't find any signs of malnutrition or lack of minerals. There is no significant difference between the two groups. So everybody here was getting enough of what they needed to keep alive and pretty healthy. Yeah. This is remarkable. We might expect to see big differences between the rich and the poor. The poor perhaps smaller and showing signs of nutritional deficiency. But not here. So can we find out more about what these people had actually been eating? Fabian, I noticed when I was looking at some of the teeth that they do seem very worn, um, very much more worn down than modern teeth. Because mainly the process of, of, of miling the of... grain is completely different. And in this time, there was a lot of stones in the flour. So, so when our Pompeians eat their nice Pompeian bread, they're yeah. also eating bits of the millstone as well. Yeah, yeah. And it, yeah. And it abrades the teeth. Yeah. Bread was such a staple food that in Pompeii alone, there are 30 bakeries. One of the biggest is on the town's high street, and it gives us a vivid picture of how Pompeians baked their daily bread. One thing that we can be certain about all the people who ended up in our cellar, rich and poor alike, is that they'd have eaten bread from the same sort of bakery, maybe even the same bakery. Now, this is a really typical baking establishment of Pompeii. I'm standing now in the area where the corn was ground. Mules would have driven these rotating mills. The main entrance to the bakery from the street was there. And this is where the dough was prepared probably by slaves. The flour was brought from this area round to here. They formed it into loaves as yet unbaked. They put those loaves on this shelf here and they whooshed through to be picked up and put in the oven here. And we know exactly what it looked like. A painting from Pompeii shows us round loaves of bread divided into eight portions. In fact, 81 carbonised loaves, cooked and ready to be sold, have been found perfectly preserved in one of the town's many ovens. And that's not all. Archaeologists have found pomegranates, walnuts, even eggs preserved for 2,000 years. Now, an extraordinary piece of new research means we can prove that it wasn't just rich Romans who ate well. In Herculaneum, nine miles from Aplontis, historian Andrew Wallace Hadrill is leading the excavation project. Herculaneum was buried under more than 50 feet of volcanic debris during the eruption of 79. Above this street was an apartment block inhabited not by Rome's super rich, but by the ordinary people of the town. What went into their mouths came out 15 feet below. Let's come down here, Mary. It's not quite so scary as it looks. Down here, the evidence of Roman diet has been perfectly preserved for two millennia. I'm not great on ladders, actually. You appear to be disappearing into the bowels of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're getting to the bit where you can see some very good downpipes here. Uh, this whole sewer is fed from above. The stuff coming down smears down the wall, generations of stuff, leaves a trail, and it's still brown. You can see very clearly how brown it is. It just leaves this trail of shit. It feels real. I mean, mm. You don't get closer to real Rome mm. than being in a cesspit, do you? No. Nope. <laughs> so you've got a layer of shit on the floor... Yep. ..and then volcanic material covering it. Exactly. Right, Beautifully okay. sealing the stuff on the floor. Right. So you take out the volcanic material and get to the shit, that's yeah. right? It's all, know, up, up, it's, it's all gone now. It's all gone now, but removed, it was yeah. up, up, up to our knees, roughly. It was really, really precious material. In archaeological terms, this is gold. You mean it's precious because it literally was what had gone through these Roman yes. lavatories? Yes. Yeah. Down here was the story of Roman diet, just waiting to be found. This is the world's largest archaeological excavation of sewers. 
over 700 bags of human waste were collected from the sewer floor and are being systematically analysed to tell us more about what Romans were eating. What have you learnt so well, far in about diet? In, in terms of diet, the amazing thing about the contents down here is the variety. You've got bones of all sorts, uh, a lot of fish bones. We're right by the sea. They had a high fish diet, uh, but also chicken and eggs. But walnuts, a good variety of nuts. So you've got a, a complete mixture between local stuff and imported stuff, which is so typical of the Roman Empire. He's only going to live well on this. He'll yeah. live healthily on this. What's important is to try and fix who the people were that were living above this cesspit yeah, and yeah. sending their cess yeah. uh, into the yeah. sewer. There are a series of shops immediately above us. Um, so some of them are shopkeepers, definitely. And then above them are two more floors of flats. And it's terribly tempting to think, because they're flats, um, these must be absolutely dirt poor. They're neither dirt poor nor stinking rich. And this is a really hard thing that, you know, people often think of the Roman world as being there, these really posh people at the top, and then everyone else is ground down and miserable. Yeah. 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 No, sorry, yeah. it's much more complicated than that. Yeah. There are, these are not really posh people. They, they aren't rich enough to live a life of luxury. They're ordinary people. They're ordinary. People. ordinary. Yeah. The excavation in the sewers supports what we found in the cellar, that rich and poor shared the same basic healthy diet. But let's not kid ourselves. The rich took every chance to show off their wealth. And where you ate was one way to do that. This is a top-of-the-range Roman dining room. But we might imagine that some of the richest of the skeletons in our cellar, even if they didn't own something like this, might once or twice have eaten somewhere like this. It's built around the idea of running, trickling, trinkling water. Water would rush down from that little niche at the back. It would then feed in to this pool here. It would feed out over the marble and it would end up in another pool with a fountain overlooking a garden beyond. The other thing that I think is quite interesting is it reveals very sharply how dependent the rich would be for their display eating on slaves. You've got to get up there to recline. How do you do it? And how would you do it in a toga? The answer must be that you were helped by your slaves. That's a very nice day-to-day -day indication of how the Roman elite relied on the servant class. Let me try and get up. This is not easy. Whoops! Now, I suppose that what I do is recline like this, but I hope to goodness they had some cushions because it really isn't very comfortable. I'm a bit far from where my wine might be in here. It certainly seems to me that this is ostentatious dining coming at the price of comfort. So, unlike today, when having money means you can eat out, if you were rich in Pompeii, you were dining at home, surrounded by opulence. But what about ordinary Pompeians who weren't living in luxury? Where were they eating? Fast food joints are one of the commonest features of the Pompeian street scene. There's over 150 of them in the city. There's 20 of them in this section of street alone. There's so many of them that they can't possibly have been for the rich alone. They probably weren't for the rich at all. They were the people who didn't have places to eat at home. They were the people coming in from the countryside or the people coming in from the port who wanted to get a bite to eat. You've got two choices if you're a customer at this bar. Either you come to the street or to the counter, see what they've got on offer in the dishes here, choose what you want, take it away, fast food. But if you've got more time 
and I guess if you've got more money, because probably like modern Naples, you've got charged more if you want to sit down, is that you go into the back room and you spend time eating and drinking at a table. I imagine it was pretty crowded, perhaps six or eight tables with people sitting around. And when you got down on the tables, when you were sitting on the chairs, at your eye level, were these lovely little scenes of life in the bar. From the storerooms of the Naples Museum, a fresco found in Pompeii has been specially brought out for me to see. Perfect. Grazie. Grazie tante. It once decorated the walls of another bar and gives us an idea of a typical Pompeian night out. They're very clever, actually, because it's not just paintings, but the paintings have got the ancient equivalent of speech bubbles attached to them. So there's a little dialogue, a little story develops. And the story is not entirely unfamiliar. After a good few drinks, two men get into an argument about a game of dice. The upshot of this we see in the sadly bashed up last scene, but happily, the writing still survives. One's saying, you scumbag, I won. And the other is saying, quite literally, no, you didn't, you cocksucker. And just at the right-hand corner, it must be the landlord, because his speech bubble is saying, look, chaps, if you want to fight, get outside. Now, I think it's nice actually ending this little series of scenes with the landlord, because it reminds us that bars are not just places where people go and get drunk and gamble and flirt, they're actually somebody's business. So where rich and poor were eating and drinking was worlds apart, but what they ate was for the most part very similar. Everybody shared the benefit of food grown in this marvellously fertile region and sourced from the plentiful Mediterranean, which in those days was right on their doorstep. It's easy to forget that in Roman times, Pompeii was absolutely off the seashore. It's only the seismic activity that means that it's now inland. Pompeii itself had a port, and there were other little harbours up and down this coastline. And goods came in from abroad, and goods went out from this rich agricultural land. It might have looked like a small provincial Italian town by the sea, but there's plenty of evidence, some of it from the skeletons in the cellar, of just how far Pompeii's international connections stretched. What we've got here is a gorgeous, gorgeous necklace. It was found near one of the skeletons. The likely candidate is that it was with a middle-aged woman. Uh, uh, and it is stunningly modern in its feel. Um, it's got a narrow neck it's going to go around. There's no way, I think it might just go around me. Um, but it's too big to be a bracelet. So it must have been a, a, a choker going, I think, tight around somebody's neck. Uh, one of the puzzles about these things always is where exactly the, the raw material for them comes from. Uh, emeralds aren't found naturally near Pompeii. The likelihood is that they come from Egypt. These roughly shaped emeralds, belonging to one of the skeletons, aren't the only evidence we have of Rome's two-way global traffic. This is one of the most extraordinary objects ever found in Pompeii. What it is, is an ivory statuette. Uh, and you only have to look at it to see this looks Indian. And it is Indian. That's where it comes from. So uh, it absolutely brings it home to you in an instant that Pompeii and the Pompeian inhabitants know about what happens in the outside world, or they have an awareness of Egypt and Africa and Asia and all the other places around the Mediterranean in a way that's quite different from what one imagines the, the, the global view of an English village might be in the 18th or 19th century. So Pompeii was a small town with a world view. But how far do our skeletons in the cellar reflect that? 
We know that Pompeii is in some ways a surprisingly multicultural little place. Yeah. There are foreign objects here, foreign imports, it's got a port, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. looking towards the outside world. What's always been much trickier to pin down is just how far the population yeah. was multicultural. Have we got any evidence from these skeletons about the makeup of Pompeian society? I mean, really, the ethnic or racial makeup? We found two skeletons where we're quite sure that they are of African ancestry. This is from the so-called rich group and there's another one, it's a female lying on her belly there and she's of African origin. Tell me how you know it's of African origin. It's just the shape of the face. I mean are you talking yeah. sub-Saharan Africa, not, not North yeah, Africa? Yeah, black. Black African. Black. What you're seeming to suggest, and I think that's a really important point, uh, is that uh, there are people living here who have uh, an origin really on the other side of the Roman Empire. Yeah. That's not the only thing interesting about the African skeleton. His skull is green, stained by metal objects, and he's in the group found with treasure. It's possible he was the slave of someone rich, but he might also have been rich himself. We can't assume all Africans were slaves. Brutal and degrading as Roman slavery certainly could be, it wasn't as straightforward as that. In one ancient cemetery outside Pompeii is a tomb that paints a much more complex picture of slavery. What you've got here is a tomb to hold the ashes of three people. And they tell you who they are. There's a man called Publius Vesonius, who is an ex-slave. And he tells you he's an ex-slave. There's a woman called Vesonia, who had actually owned him and then freed him. And my guess is they'd probably then got married. And he's also putting it up for the guy on the right, a friend of his. The first text says Vesonius put this up for this trio. But the text underneath tells the sequel, which isn't so happy. Stop and read this, he says. Because that guy on the right, who I thought was my friend, turned out to be false. In fact, says Vesonius, he took me to court. We quarrelled and he took me to court. But luckily, my innocence and the gods above saved me. But he was a complete bastard. We don't know why this man didn't just remove his ex-friend's statue. It's what I would have done. But luckily he didn't, as this monument tells a fascinating story. Here was an ex-slave rich enough to put up this big tomb for three and then to go to court to settle a dispute with his former friend. The point about Roman slavery is that it isn't always a lifetime sentence. Slaves get freed by the people who own them, and they sometimes go on to do very well. In fact, my guess is that a majority, probably, of the Pompeian population, certainly some of the people in our cellar, would have had slaves somewhere in their ancestry. It's been calculated that more than half the population of Herculaneum were descended from slaves. And slaves certainly sometimes did what we think of as high-status jobs. There's evidence for that in a very surprising place. Here you have the bog. There's probably one seat here. And then, and yes, you can come and sit by me. Yep. You see, what's brilliant about this is that the last person to use this loo before the eruption happened has left his name. It starts with an A here. That's right. And it's, what it's saying is, it's his name, it's Apollinaris. Yes. Medicus T. Medicus, Medicus yes. And then T. 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 Imp. imp. So that's Apollinaris, the doctor of the Emperor Titus. Then you can't read this any longer because it's got too faded, but we what know it, it, it said. Hic it, bene cacavit. Had a good, good shit, shit here. Yeah. This name, Apollinaris, we can't be certain, but it's very likely a slave name. Mm. So yes. the Emperor's doctor is a slave. Now, mm. We tend to think 
of slave jobs as being very drudge manual mm. labour, and some of them certainly were, but slaves also did high, in our terms, high status professional mm. jobs like being doctors. So that's another reason why yeah. slavery but, is more complicated. But also to be a think. slave of the emperor is to be really someone quite important. In some ways, it's better to be a slave of oh. an emperor than an ordinary oh. free-born uh, person with a tiny little shop in, in Herculaneum. I'd much rather be the Emperor Titus's slave doctor than a he was, flower seller he in was the streets on, of Pompeii. He was on the way up, this yeah. guy. Yeah. So slavery was a fact of life in Pompeii. Almost certainly, some of the people in our cellar were slaves. They died right next to their masters as they would have lived. At the house of the baker on the main street of Pompeii, we find a nice illustration of that closeness in a painting on the dining room wall. These guys don't look too pissed yet, um, although I think we can imagine what might happen next. But the giveaway scene is in the background, where that lady is clearly about to keel over and she's being propped up by the slave behind her. I imagine the slaves came in pretty handy for this kind of job. But it wasn't just slaves and masters living on top of each other. Here in the baker's house, right next to the smart dining room, there's a stable. And in the stable, the bones of the animals, the ones that used to turn the mills which ground the grain, and no doubt delivered the bread around town too. Here we've got the finest room in the baker's residential quarters, right up next to where the mules lived. And just a few yards away is the back end of a really rich house in Pompeii that was being given a complete makeover at the time of the eruption. So the rich are living right next door, right up against the working bakery. The baker has his poshest room right next door to his animals. That's how Pompeians lived, cheek by jowl. And that's how we find the people in the cellar. Rich and poor, male and female, old and young, lying close to each other in death, just as they would have been in life. But in 79 AD, that life came to an end. Neither they nor the others in this town had any idea that they lived in the shadow of a volcano. The last major eruption had been 1,500 years before. Nothing could prepare the population for what happened when Vesuvius exploded. People in the cellar had just one choice, to try and escape or stay and find shelter. From out at sea, you get a very good impression of how Vesuvius really lowers over the whole area. But also, you get this slightly uncomfortable sense of how very close the volcano is. It makes you realise how difficult it would have been to escape from it especially if you left it a little bit too late. While friends and neighbours fled, we know that our 54 people looked for cover and many took their most precious belongings with them. Why most of them stayed put, we can only guess. But in one case, there's a strong clue. Fabian, tell me about the remains of this person that you've got laid out here. This is maybe one of the most dramatic and tragic uh, persons we found in, this, in the whole sample, because these are the bones of a young female, and we found with the skeleton this small bone, the pelvic bone of a fetus, and uh, she must have been pregnant. Right. If you measure it, you can determine it was in the last month of pregnancy and it was, yeah, it's quite dramatic. 
The thought of being eight and a half months pregnant and trying to flee for your life from the erupting volcano is um, something just dreadful. Amazingly, an eyewitness account of the eruption survives. It describes how on that fateful day you could hear the shrieks of women, the squalling of infants and the shouting of men. Some calling out for their parents, others for their children or their wives. It was so dark they could only recognise them by their voices. Many pleaded for the help of the gods, but more thought that the gods had disappeared and that the world had been plunged into eternal darkness. It must have been pitch black when the volcanic debris started to fall and our people tried to escape. Several of them certainly have brought lamps with them. This one is rather nice because uh, the centre, just where the oil goes in, got a lovely picture here of the goddess of Rome herself. She's sadly broken in half, but she's quite recognisable with her helmet on. The people in the cellar were sheltering there as the eruption intensified outside, plunging them further into darkness. Heaven knows how you could have found your way through the streets at night using just one of these. It makes me realise how vulnerable the people in this cellar must have felt. They fled through the darkness all trace of the sun has been obliterated by the volcanic debris. They've come in here, they're huddled together for shelter and support. And the only protection against the dark they've got is half a dozen little lamps like this. Of course, in the end, these people couldn't protect themselves from the same fate as the others in Pompeii. But the Romans in the cellar didn't just leave us with evidence of their tragic death but of the lives they lived too. It may have been a male-dominated world where the rich dined in luxury and exploited the poor, but Pompeii was also a place where slaves could earn their freedom, where women could own wealth, and the ordinary Roman could eat and drink well. It was a place where even the poorest knew something of the world outside. People who died in this cellar help us to understand that Roman society wasn't quite as black and white as we often imagine it to be. Sure, these people would have had vastly different lifestyles, but they lived cheek by jowl and they shared a lot too. The smells, the dark and the dirt. Not to mention the wine, the sex, the food and the fun. And in the end, of course, they shared the same fate in the same cellar 2,000 years ago. And tomorrow here on BBC HD, we chart the rise and fall of the Roman Empire in ancient worlds at nine. Next this evening, though, there's comedy coming up with Miranda.